Good evening and welcome. Thank you for tuning in and happy Burns Night. Why am I doing this? I'm English. But I was born English, but I lived in Scotland for a time. And as a Sinclair, my roots go deep into Scotland. But then Scotland's roots go deep the world over. My grandfather, Charlie Sinclair, was born in 1900, towards the end of that very painful period of exodus from Scotland that largely began with the Highland clearances in the 1600s, mowing people off the land to make way for sheep. They moved through assisted passages where landowners paid the fares of their tenants to leave because the land could no longer support them and they didn't give them a choice. And from the 17th century, a positive new factor. Good schools and rising literature, literacy in a disproportionately intelligent population resulted in five universities serving a million people, which led to the rise of a highly educated middle class. <clears throat> but in an underdeveloped economy, there weren't enough jobs for all these doctors and engineers and clerics and teachers, which led to the biggest brain drain in history as Scots headed to Africa and Canada and Australia and the Far East as traders and missionaries and architects, bridge builders, labourers, you name it, the eternal benefit of the rest of the world. So my grandfather was the second youngest of ten children and his father was given an opportunity to start a new career in Canada. However, the two youngest children were considered too young to make the voyage. So their parents made what I'm sure was a heartbreaking, but at that time, not uncommon, decision to leave Charlie and his younger sister at Bernardo's children's home. <clears throat> Obviously, Charlie grew up to be okay, uh, but I'm aware that there'll also be Sinclair celebrating in Canada tonight. But when I was living in the borders, I attended a Burns night and my accent stood out. I happened to mention that I'd been to other Burns nights in England and I was asked, England? What, why did the English give a shit about Abby? And I didn't know. I said something about him being a great poet and I steered the conversation onto something I was more comfortable with, but <clears throat> it made me consider the question more deeply. Important Burns suppers take place every year all over the world, in countries with celebrated poets of their own. The English have Shakespeare, the Irish have Joyce, the Americans have Longfellow, the Italians have Dante, the Germans have Goethe, all famed and respected across the world in their own right, but none of them get this annual birthday homage, even in their own country, let alone abroad. I've never been invited to a Shakespeare supper or a Dante dinner, or a Baudelaire Barbie, even a Browning buffet. So I decided to find out the answer and give you a few thoughts that maybe you can take away and dwell upon from time to time, so that if you were ever asked, as I once was, why we make such a fuss about Robert Burns, you'll be able to tell them. <clears throat> and the first thought is, it's got to be for something beyond the power of his poetry. Scotland's produced other world-class poets like Alan Ramsey, Robert Ferguson, two of the world's greatest prose writers in Walter Scott and Robert Louis Stevenson. But they're not revered like Rabbi, Rabbi. And I, I bet nobody can tell me when they were born. But people across the world know what happens on January the 25th. How did this come about? The first celebration was held in January 1801, just five years after his death. And Burns Nights have been held around the world every year since. I read somewhere it's celebrated in over 200 countries. That's more than Christmas. And it triggers a chain reaction of friendship and cups of kindness right around the world. When a Burns Supper in Auckland is finishing, it's still going on in Sydney and Perth. And they'll just be sitting down in Tokyo and Singapore to eat. An hour or two later, They'll be addressing the haggis in Calcutta. And this chain of warmth and fellowship follows the setting sun westward through Asia and the Middle East and Africa and across the Mediterranean to Europe and Britain before it crosses the Atlantic and then sweeps across America and so on right around the world and around the clock 
for days. And there's not a single hour of the day or night for all those days when a burn supper is not taking place somewhere on this earth. In fact, four days ago, Haggis was launched into space to celebrate Burns Night. Why? Why are there more statues of Burns than any other figure in world literature? It's not as if Scotland didn't have plenty of other people to crow about. He was writing during the great Scottish Enlightenment, that period in the late 18th century when Scotland produced more men of letters, more men of learning, more men of science than any other nation on earth. In just about every field of human endeavour, a Scot was the leading name. In Edinburgh, <clears throat> there was David Hume, the great philosopher, one of the greatest minds the world's ever known. On the other side of Charlotte Square lived his good friend, Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of Nations, which turned the economics world upside down. Um, he wrote about the division of labour for the first time. Scots led the way in maths and physics and chemistry, in geology, in engineering, in medicine, in jurisprudence, in exploring. In architecture, Scotland led the world with the Adam brothers, who began in Kirkcuddy, but were commissioned everywhere from Boston to St Petersburg, and they were copied not just by other architects, but by jewellers and ironmongers in pottery and stone. And furniture makers and bookbinders right across, across the world copied them. Um, we've all seen a knock-off Adam fireplace. It was also the golden age of Scottish art. <clears throat> Runciman and Ramsay and Rayburn. And yet, with all these great men burning brightly in the world, it was the star of Rabbi Burns that rose up in the mall. Why? Well, you might say it's because he did more than anyone else before or since to preserve the language and heritage of Scotland. But bigger than that, he did it at a time when a wave of Anglicisation was threatening to strangle Scottishness, beginning with the power and with the union of the crowns in 1603, it snowballed into the union of parliaments in 1707, it became a tidal wave after the crushing of the Jacobite rebellion in 1746. The Peritable Jurisdictions Act and the Disarming Acts were passed. The bagpipe was declared an instrument of war. Tartan was banned. That lasted 36 years. Hundreds were executed. Thousands were transported to the colonies. Even more were told they were going to be transported and then were just herded onto ships, only for the ships to be set alight with everyone on them and burned at the dock. Burns called them evil days, <clears throat> and he wrote about them. They banished him beyond the sea, and ere the bud was on the tree, at down my cheeks the puddles ran, embracing my John Highland man. But look, they catched him at the last, and bound him in a dungeon fast, my curse upon them every one. They hanged my bro, John Highland man. So it wasn't just unfashionable to be Scots, it could be deadly. All over the Scotland, the Scots were embracing Englishness. Schools were teaching this fashionable new, ling new language. Parents were sending their children to Oxbridge rather than Utrecht or Paris where they'd gone in the past. And the ultimate insult came when the sycophantic James Craig, architect of the new town of Edinburgh, made it a monument to the family who drove all this carnage by naming all the streets after them. And so we have George Street and Frederick Street and Hanover Street and the rest. This anglicisation ravaged the language and the culture and the heritage. A Scots poet called James Beattie, who was um, professor of moral theology at uh, University of Aberdeen wrote, poetry is not poetry unless it's written in English. Perhaps that's why you've never been to a James Beattie supper. So that was the age in which Burns lived and worked as a tenant farmer. That was the frozen ground on which he chose to throw the seeds of his poetry. And thankfully, he didn't think like the rest of them. <clears throat> he wrote 
the poetic genius of my country found me as the prophetic bard Elijah did Elisha at the plough and threw her inspiring mantle over me. She bade me sing the loves, the joys, the rural scenes and the rural pleasures of my natal soil in my native tongue. So that's how he wrote. He wrote against the cultural tide of the time. He wrote in the teeth of prejudice. But he wrote with a beauty and a power and a simplicity that few could match. Till all the seas gang dry, my dear, till the rocks melt with the sun, I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands of life shall run. Thirty words, thirty powerful, penetrating, unforgettable words, and every one of them a monosyllable. I can't think of anyone else who can convey that amount of power and tenderness with that simplicity. And if you look at the landscape of his writing, it's swept across the whole of human life, from the heights of achievement to the depths of despair, friendship and love and loss and the joy of nature, from the tiniest speck to the whole of creation. At the smallest end of that scale, he actually finds poetry in a louse, burrowing into the hair of a pretty woman sitting in front of him in church. And he gives it a good nature telling off for having such a cheek. Ha! Where are you going, you crawling furly? Your impudence protects you certainly. I canna say but ye struck there, you old gauze and lace. Oh, faith, I fear ye dine but spare thee on sick a place. It's quite typical, he points out, that it doesn't matter how posh or beautiful the host is, a scalp is just a scalp. Moving up the scale, Burns finds empathy with a mouse whose nest he's turned over with his plough. And he recognises they're both trying to scratch an existence from this tough landscape. And he tells his fellow mortal he needn't be afraid. Two beings with so much in common should have nothing to fear from each other. And the mouse probably has less to fear than he has. <clears throat> oh, we sleek it, cowering, timorous beastie. The panic's in thy breastie. Thou need the start away so hasty with bickering brattle. Thou be late to run and chase thee with muttering prattle. Upscaling again, when Burns examines a single man, he makes the point that all men are born equal, and man's worth has nothing to do with his wealth or the size of his estate, because a man's a man, what are that? On a larger lens, he scrutinises <coughs> the massive subject of love. In A Fond Kiss, he boils down the ecstasy and pain of love to the raw and unbearable emotion of having loved and then having to part. <coughs> A Fond Kiss, and then we sever. A Farewell, and then forever. Deep in heart-wrung tears I'll pledge thee. Warring sighs and groans I'll wage thee. Who shall say that fortune grieves him while the star of hope she leaves him? Me. Nay, cheerful twinkle lights me. Dark despair around benights me. He beautifully skewers on his pen emotions that most of us could never even talk about. And my false lover stole my rose, but ah, he left the thorn with me. And yet, <clears throat> while he could zoom in on the tiniest of creatures and the tenderest of feelings, Burns' genius was it he could also unite the whole world at important times because it's Burns we sing as we ring in the new year with his message of friendship and hope. Now there is a hand, my trusty fear, and gives a hand of thine, and we'll take a right good will you watch for old Lang Syne. His work ranges from 
like party pieces to some of the greatest stories ever written. <clears throat> Tam Shanta tells the story of a jolly drunkard who stumbles into a coven of demons and witches and he barely escapes with his life. That's too big for me to do here, but do yourself a favour and read it. And he didn't just stand up against society. <coughs> Paulie Woolley's prayer is one of the bravest satires ever written, taking on the might of the church at a time when to be excluded from it meant you might as well not exist. But to Robert Burns, his most important job was not as a poet or a ploughman, but to preserve the traditional folk songs of Scotland, all Scotia's melting airs, as he called them. It's like taking on the job of mending the nets of all the country's fishermen. It was a labour of love. He collected these songs wherever he went, <clears throat> and he patched them, and he stitched them, and then he polished them until they shone. Each one could have been lost, but now it's a gem. He could take a bawdy ballad where an old lady complains her husband couldn't get it up anymore <clears throat> and weave it into a beautiful hymn to marriage. <clears throat> John Anderson, my Joe, John, we climb the hill together and many a canty day, John, we've had we on another. And now we mon totter down, John, and hand in hand we'll go and sleep together at the foot, John Anderson, my Joe. We could feel in his words how much he adored his beloved Jean in the 14 songs he dedicated to her, particularly the one that ends with the couplet, there's not a bonny bird that sings but minds me of my Jean. So that explains why he's remembered dearly by the Scots, but why should he have mattered for all these years to people around the rest of the world? Well, <clears throat> as I say, we lived in a world where you're either blessed with wealth or crushed by oppression, privilege or poverty by accident of birth. And Burns had the balls to stand up against that oppression, that, hos that hostility, and he had the brains and the brilliance to hold up a mirror to all people. He sympathised with the poor and the oppressed, but he loved and empathised with all men and women of every class and kind in a way that I can't think of any other writer being able to do. He wrote about the haggis. Why the haggis? Why do we still eat it tonight in this memory? Why did he call this bag of oats and innards and leftovers the great chieftain of the pudding race? I think it's because all chieftains look after the smallest and weakest of their people. Only the wealthy could afford the big cuts in meat, but to take what was left and turn it into a delicious, nutritious meal that could grace the poorest tables and still end up on the tables of the powerful symbolised the spirit of the Scots, finding a way to survive and thrive in the harshest of landscapes and the toughest of times. A haggis is a dish for every man, and similarly Burns expressed the voice, the thoughts, and the hopes of all people. He said, God knows I'm no saint. I have a host of follies and sins to answer for, but if I could, and I believe I do it as far as I can, I would wipe the tears from all eyes. Is there anyone in world literature who writes with that sort of compassion for his fellow man? All this great body of work, all these memories, and yet he died at the age of just 37. On July the 25th, 1796, he left behind 14 children that he knew of, one that was born on the day that he died, and a billion brothers. We can only imagine what he might have achieved if he'd lived any longer. <clears throat> As his funeral procession wound through the streets of Dumfries, it fell silent as it got to the gates of St Michael's churchyard and a voice in the crowd was heard to say, And who will be our poet now? 
And that's a question I don't think has been answered 224 years later. When William Wordsworth, who many think was England's greatest poet, heard Burns had died, he wrote, <clears throat> I mourned with thousands, but as one more deeply grieved. For he was gone whose light I hailed when first it shone, and showed my youth how verse may build a princely throne on a simple truth. So that's why we say the memory of Burns is immortal. I hope you can take some of this away and tell people if they ask you why. Tell them he did more to preserve the language, the culture, the heritage, the traditions and the very nationhood of Scotland than anyone else. And he did it at a time when Scotland faced the greatest threat to its existence than ever before or since. <clears throat> And there are a lot of people in a lot of countries around the world that can relate to that. Will there ever be a better poet? James Bark wrote, Before he can be surpassed, a new race will have to be born. A different and greater species than Homo sapiens. And so, I invite all of you to fill your glasses and join me in a toast to the immortal memory of the world's greatest poet, Robert Burns. Stand your back.